cough drop. All right. It's Ooh, it. It. No, yeah, it's funky. It's a funky one. It's um holistic. So it was like blackberry, elderberry. That's what it is. It's elderberry and zinc. Elderberry. So yeah, it's it's not that bad tasting, but that with the the apple cider and and now I have this like ass taste in the back of my mouth. I'm not gonna ask you why you know what an ass tastes like, but it's <laughs> I'm, well, I'm saying it's not it's not a good taste, but it's more of like a it's like a loogie taste. You know when you cough that up and it's like that immediate oh shit I'm sick loogie taste. Yeah, yeah, that's that taste that I have in the back of my throat now. Good times. <laughs> So anyways, do you want to do this podcast? <laughs> Let's do this podcast thing. Sweet. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Creatures of the Night Paranormal. And you're Wendy. And you're Craig. Yeah, we mixed it up. You see how we do that yeah. shit sometimes? Every <laughs> once in a while we show you that we know each other's names. <laughs> <laughs> Good for us. Uh, actually, if this is the first time you're ever listening to our show, uh, Chris and I have been friends yeah, since the Dark Ages almost. I mean, oh, that's how God. old we are. Uh, I think it, it seems like it was the Dark Ages when we became friends because we were searching for our other person, you yeah. know, and then all of a sudden there you were, Wendy. There you were. <laughs> that is so sweet how you put that together. We were just lost in the darkness and then we found the light, each other. In the darkness where we paranormal hunt. Yeah, we went <laughs> back into the darkness, but together. Together. Yeah. <laughs> So yes. It wasn't as scary. You know, it's always good no. to go in pairs. Yes. Safe. Your buddy system. Wow, I haven't heard that in a long time, but that's so true. You need your buddy when you're doing that sort of thing, especially in the dark. Yeah. In the scary place. So when you find your paranormal buddy, I mean, it's like, okay, this is it. Me and you. <laughs> forever. <laughs> I don't know how people do it when it's like uh, four or five, six to the group. How are they like so in tune? Because we do everything side by side. Yeah. Ugh, gross. More friends. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> I imagine they still pair up. So you use an example of like TV shows that we watch or whatever. I mean, on Ghost Hunters, there was those yeah. two guys that really got along. And then there's Grant and Jason that really yeah. get along. And I guess if you look at... Uh, Ghost Adventures, I mean, uh, Zach and Aaron have been doing this for a long time together. So maybe, I mean, even though they seem like they kind of all work yeah. together pretty yeah. well. But for a long time, it was like Aaron and Zach. And then they would pair up Jay and um, Billy together. <laughs> that other guy. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just trying to make it seem normal that we're really attached yeah. to each other. When all I was really <laughs> trying to get at is <laughs> that we have known each other for a really long time. We met each other when we were teenagers, practically. Are you breaking up with me? Or, <laughs> yes. yes. This is it. I can't stand you anymore. Um, Who will I podcast with? I've just outgrown. <laughs> I mean, so we've known each other since we were teenagers, but for a long time, we were just like a part of a group of friends. Then we realized that, uh, you know, that we both had this shared interest and we were like, oh, oh my, my God. God, let's do that together. Always. <laughs> And then it's been like 10 years now and, you know, we're basically like family going because strong. of all the, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so every birthday and Christmas and even Mother's Day, you always like send me a card and I send you one and, you know, we're family. So that's, we celebrate holidays together and stuff. And so my story kind of comes from the fact that not too long ago, I was like uh, trying to clean out some cabinets in my house. And I found a uh, Bible. There were there were a bunch of books in the bottom of my this cabinet, and I was trying to clean them up and straighten it. And this Bible had stuff stuck inside of it. It was kind of funny. Uh -oh. I just sent you a text. <laughs> it, inside the Bible was a card that you sent me before, and it it has dinosaurs on it. And it's basically like when the meteor hit the. You know, and like oh, into the dinosaurs, <laughs> and I just thought it was funny that that was inside of a Bible, like because you know they don't talk about that. <laughs> no, they sure don't. Oh my god, that is so funny, and I love that card because the dinosaurs yeah. are holding hands with their itty bitty. So it's like arms. two T Rexes <laughs> holding hands, and the meteors coming for them, and they're like, you know, they're treating it like it's a shooting star. It says, "Oh, make a wish." <laughs> It was just so funny because at first I was just like, oh, my God, this is the funniest card. And I was showing everyone in my house. And then they were like, did you just pull that out of a Bible? And I was like, yeah, I don't know why it's in there. <laughs> 
You like to be ironic to yourself. <laughs> this will be the perfect place to keep it. <laughs> wow, that is so funny. And I guess that was for a birthday or something like that. You always find the best cards. I've always said that you're the best gift giver. <laughs> but also stuffed inside this Bible were pamphlets. Oh. So I had visited, you know, when we lived in Memphis, Tennessee, or outside of it, we weren't that far from Nashville. And we I probably went up to Nashville once a year for something. We've gone um, for shopping and whatnot. But I think I was up there once by myself for some kind of business trip situation. And I would, I went to Franklin to do a walking ghost tour, like all by myself. I was like, I'm such a big girl. I'm going to go do this. Yes. <laughs> I, I have um, pamphlets on Franklin ghost tours right? here too. <laughs> so, so that's probably a lot of the places that I'm about to mention, or it's got, or it's got my okay. places on there because that was what was inside this Bible was like three or actually it was like a so five funny. pamphlets of different places that I guess I was like, I'm going to check this out. I'm gonna, We're going to go mm-hmm. back here. And I'm just like collecting pamphlets of like, because yeah. I'm going to come back and tell you, we've got to go investigate these locations. They say they're super haunted oh, or whatever. Because yes. it was just like a one hour walking ghost tour. They tell you some stories and then you're gone. It wasn't like a real investigation. So these were my like, but these yeah. locations on the list. Okay. Yeah, and Nashville was super convenient to us because it was what a, maybe a four-hour drive with traffic and construction. It was ultra convenient. You really kick it, you can get it there in three hours. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Or if there's a tornado, it might turn into an eight-hour experience. You know, it just really depends. <laughs> oh, Tennessee weather. That is fun. Oh. Um, but these pamphlets, I was looking through them and I was like, I'm going to totally, we never got to investigate any of these locations, you know, and now we've moved away yeah. and I don't know that we ever will go back for these experiences. Yeah. But I was like, I want to do my service to these locations. I'm going to do a podcast story on them. It's just funny. I keep all of my pamphlets right here. It's sticking out of all of my pamphlets. It's the one that's like, it was like this here. I'm moving my camera so you can see my, my pamphlet bin, <laughs> but it was like right here. So it's uh, like, hello, look at me. <laughs> that's so weird. I, I stick pamphlets everywhere, obviously. And in yes, Bible. in Bibles. <laughs> <laughs> and the desk that I'm sitting at, there's pamphlets and maps inside them where in, in backpacks, in uh, suitcases, I find pamphlets for haunted things, yep. maps of cities I think are haunted or states or whatever. I leave little trinkets all over the place so that I can find them and be like, oh, I remember this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the worst about that. I'll have to send you more cards. <laughs> so our story starts in 1830 with Fountain, that's his name, Fountain Branch Carter. Wow. He built Yeah, that's a fancy fucking name there. You don't hear that one often. (laughs) Wait, his last name is the most normal of the three. (laughs) We probably should have done that backwards or something. Wow. Put the Carter on the front. That's interesting. It's it's an interesting name. So Fountain Branch Carter built a a one-and-a-half-story brick house just south of downtown Franklin, Tennessee. For his family, his wife, Polly, and their 12 children. (laughs) Come on, man. I know there's nothing else to do in Tennessee. (laughs) I don't think in 1830, yeah, they weren't. Shit. So, well, sadly, out of the 12, only eight would reach adulthood. But for those times, those are decent numbers. Yeah. Still a lot of kids to take care of. Yeah. So the sons were Moscow. No. Which doesn't seem like an odd name when you think there's a Moscow, Tennessee, too. And you wonder, did he have something to do with that? I didn't dig deeper into oh. that. <laughs> but Moscow, James Thedrick, the fourth. But he went by Todd <laughs> <laughs> and also Francis. The daughters, they're Mary Alice, Sarah, Annie, and Francine. Okay. You know Francis and Francis. Francine hated each other. They must have. <laughs> they just were getting lazy at the end or they were super in love <laughs> F names. I don't know. I mean, I get it. Back in 1830, they probably didn't have the um, best baby names of the yearbook out yet. So it was probably (laughs) tougher for them to come up with something, you know, unique. You would assume that they use a lot of family names then. And that's how they get it. They don't just sit around and think, I've always liked this name I've never heard of, you know, or something like that. Or like a neighbor I met forever ago or something like that. I guess that could happen. 
His wife's name was interesting. Her name was Polly. That's an uncommon name. I, I love it, though. It's so cute. It is cute. A fountain and Polly. Yeah. What a couple. Uh, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Carter had a successful business within town, but after the construction of his new home, he saw the opportunity to pursue farming. Over the next 20 years, the Carter farm grew from just 19 acres to 288 acres. That's a big ass fucking farm. Uh, yeah. What were they farming? Everything. Uh, <laughs> well, honestly, I didn't dig into it, but there's another uh, plantation I'll talk about, and they were doing, you know, tobacco and cotton, mm. and they did have their own cotton gin, so obviously they're doing cotton, okay. but I think that they can do things like, you know, just vegetables itself, and then, yeah. like, tobacco was a big thing in that area. Sure. I, I don't know if they had livestock, but, I mean, obviously that's an option as well. Yeah, with 288 acres yeah i mean so they grew this home and farm in value over those 20 years immensely i mean yeah. they've been very well for themselves and just 110 steps from the carter house is the lotes house which was built in 1838 by german immigrant johann albert lotes which i think is the who's the picture on your flyer over there you don't know oh let's see uh it's a lady that's on mine I, I don't think that's a, a Johan. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> it looked familiar from something that I had researched, but I don't know. Maybe that just all those ladies look the same. <laughs> <laughs> she was a spicy Victorian Tennessee lady. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's all of them. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Johan had purchased the land that he built his home on from the Carter family. So they were neighbors. Uh, Johan was a master carpenter and constructed his home all himself without the use of uh, slave labor. I thought you were going to say without the use of nails. <laughs> <laughs> it's a log cabin. <laughs> no, it's, it's actually this way, really way. big. It's fancier than the Carter's house. And it was very eloquently done. He used it to display his craftsmanship and his fine, you know, eye for detail throughout the house so that it could be a show home for a potential client. Oh, he was mixing business with pleasure. You know, he knew oh. how to make the most for his dollar. So Johan and his wife, Margarita, bore six children, Paul, Amelia, Augustus, Matilda, and twins, Julius and Julia. You know, it'd make more sense if Francis and Francine were twins too, but they didn't say they were. So yeah. whatever. <laughs> A few short miles down the road from the Carter and Lotes house was the Carton Plantation. The Carton Plantation was built in 1826 by former Nashville Mayor Randall McGavick. It was a grand plantation home as well as a successful farming and livestock business. The home was inherited by Randall McGavick's son, John, after his death. John grew the farm's net worth to $339,000 in 1860, which is equivalent to $9.7 million to last year's money. Not even this year's money. Now that it's a billion dollars. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> That is a boatload of money back in the day. Before you even gave me the last year's equivalent, I was just like 1800s and he's making $339,000. That is a boatload of money. Yes. They are fancy pants fucking people in the neighborhood. You know, yeah. they had three horses. <laughs> I'm sure they had a lot more horses than that. Shit, but yeah, that's crazy. That's a crazy amount of money. It is. They were doing quite well. Yeah. Um, honestly, we don't want to boast too much about them because we can assume why they were doing so well. They had free labor. They were assholes yeah. uh, deep down. But, you know, to them, it was normal. Everybody was doing it, whatever. I'm not I'm not going to even yeah. go there with that. But out of the three homes that I talk about here, this was the well to do family mm -hmm. down the street. And it is the biggest house out of the three. And, you know, it shows it's very grand on the inside of it as well. Yeah. John McGavick married his cousin. Mm. <laughs> Normal well, then, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to include that, but then I was like, might as well. Might don't as well. want anybody calling me out. <laughs> was, he married his fucking cousin, okay? All okay? Right. We yep. don't all marry our cousins, but John did. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Uh, her name was Carrie Elizabeth Winder, Winder, maybe it's uh, W I N D E R. Uh, in December of 1848, they had five children total, but three of them had died at young ages. That's Martha, Mary Elizabeth, and John Randall. Their surviving children were Winder, or Winder, and Hattie. Wait, I thought Winder or Winder was their last name. It's her last name, but they named one of their children. I like that. Oh, that was her maiden name. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I was like, what's your maiden name? Could you have named a kid after that? Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> I get sidetracked within our podcast. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> <we're> like, oh. <laughs> Wait, go back to talking about how we've known each other for like, you know, eons and be like, who are you? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> for years, these three families would enjoy a peaceful existence in their small farming town. Mm. But that all changed the day they would find themselves at the epicenter of the five bloodiest hours oh. in all of U.S. history. Hold on. My ghost tours and more doesn't say anything about five bloodiest hours. I would have been rushing right over to that tour. <laughs> Let me tell you about it then. Okay. In the fall of 1864, the Union Army, expecting the Confederacy to attack soon, began to mobilize large numbers of soldiers in the general area of the Carter and Lotes house. Mm -hmm. The Union soldiers cut down trees to prevent any surprise attacks by Confederate troops. They didn't yep. want sniper attacks or anybody sneaking up on them in the middle of the night. Oh. And even poisoned the fucking water supply in the area, just in case they got too close. It's like they, <laughs> they're, it's like they're putting out rat traps, you know, or whatever. Trying to stop them before they get too yeah, close. But poisoning the water supply. What were they drinking then? Exactly. Where, <laughs> where were they bringing their fucking water in? They found like one pond and they were like, well, don't touch this. This is what we're drinking. Right. Listen, and they didn't let people know that this is what they were doing. Oh, the reason come on. that the families in the area found out is because sadly, the Lotes children, the twins, Julius and Julia, were playing nearby the streams. And they drank the water or ingested it and then later died from the poisoned water. Oh, those bastards. I saw reports that they said that the children were only two years old at the time, which makes me wonder why the fuck were you letting two year olds <laughs> playing around? Like it, what? What is happening here? Shouldn't a nanny or a mom be dying as well? Because they should have been right there with them. So I don't know if that's yeah. correct about the ages or anything like that. If they were toddler is or yeah. if they were actually two years old. But it seemed pretty, you know, crazy yeah. that they were out by themselves. But they did pass away. You know, I'm not sure about how old they were at the time. Yeah. They were like, yeah, we could we could do with a few less kids around here. Uh, no. Twins, go play by that pond over there. Just hang out for a while, guys. We'll see you soon. Love ya. <laughs> Maybe they thought they were looking out for each other. You know, they're yeah, two right. of them. They're fine. Yeah, buddy system. Buddy system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After the family realized the seriousness of the situation themselves and that their homes were in, like, I don't think it really hit them about what was going on and how much it could affect them until like this happened to the children. Uh, so they realized war was fucking coming to Franklin and they just didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to go. They didn't know when it was going to happen. You know, they didn't know if this is something that's going to happen tomorrow or a year from now, but they realized that they were under this kind of, you know, occupied territory situation and that it wasn't as free and happy as it used to be type thing. Oh, no more hippies, huh? <laughs> <laughs> then on November 30th, 1864, Lieutenant General John Bell Hood of the Confederate Army was becoming more and more frustrated. He had gotten news that Tennessee forces failed to contain a large amount of Union troops in Columbus the night before. I'm assuming they mean Columbus, Tennessee, because that does exist. Yeah. So there is lots of cities named Columbus. Yeah, but I'm, assuming, <laughs> I'm assuming they mean Columbus, Tennessee. It is close in proximity to Franklin area. Hood, not thinking a damn thing through, ordered an all-out 
frontal assault against the Union forces at Franklin, despite the protests of his other commanders. Before daybreak, the Union Brigadier General. I like saying that. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting (laughs) kind of general. (laughs) Brigadier General. He's not no plain general or mm -hmm. lieutenant general. Yeah, no, it sounds like he's just a step above all you other basic generals. (laughs) (laughs) That's uh, Jacob D. Cox woke the Carter family and took possession of their house to make the parlor his own headquarters. The fighting began at 4 p.m. in the waning afternoon sunlight when 20,000 Confederates attacked a similar number of entrenched Union troops. Oh, shit. The Carter family and several of their slaves and the neighboring Lotz family took refuge in the north room of the basement as the battle began to rage around them in the Carter house, by the way. I, mm. For some reason, that's not properly in my sentence, but they're in the <laughs> Carter house basement, not the Lotes family. I don't think they had a okay. basement. Yeah. They also had a wooden house versus the brick home. So I don't know if that was their logic in all of it. Oh, man. This sounds really scary. Could you imagine? We were talking about tornadoes, you know? Yeah. And the, like, think of like, oh, well, this shit's going down and I have no control over it. What's yeah. the safest thing for me to do? Get in the bathtub. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. That's what you do for tornadoes. Yes, right. That's what you do. <laughs> but it's like some guy comes in, he commandeers your home. And you're like, well, shit, there's really nothing I can do but uh, hope for the best and hug my knees in the basement. Yeah, and just wait for it to all be over with. And it's a really good thing that the Lotes family took shelter at the Carter's Instead of staying in their home because a cannonball crashed through the roof of their house and a second floor bedroom before landing and rolling into the first floor, leaving an indentation that is still visible today. Yeah, if it crashed through the roof. (laughs) I can see where it lands. (laughs) You don't get that dent out, you know. (laughs) I have some chipped tiles. No. Never fixing those. The dent wizard <laughs> couldn't take the uh, the dent <laughs> off of that one. <laughs> no, it's pretty rough. Though the Carter house wasn't left unscathed. Uh, bullet holes are still plainly visible in the walls of the farmhouse office building wow. and around the, the entire brick home in the Carter house. You think there's any bullets still in there? Has to be. That'd be crazy. Who's going to dig them out? I would. Well, you know what? There's probably some historians and type people that have gotten in there and gotten that out. Because they were like, I need that. That'll be really cool. That's right. That's what I'm saying. Like, (laughs) I need that. (laughs) Wendy, keep a lookout. I got to dig out a bullet. (laughs) (laughs) But if we ever make it back to Nashville area and go to this house, we definitely inspect those bullet holes. We get magnets, very heavy ones. You know, the Birdcage Theater has a bunch of bullet holes. We should check them (gasps) out. Oh. They're all drywall and are stucco shit too, though. Stucco, so they fell yeah. Down. Harder to find. You'd have to tear the whole wall up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be responsible for that. No, thank you. No, That's... shit probably fell down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the Southerners advanced across an open field. Many of their Union opponents were armed with repeaters, which are basically mm-hmm. like semi-automatic weapons. They they didn't have to. It wasn't like a musket, you know. So they could shoot yeah. several rounds off. They had to they have to cock it every time, but still, it's faster. And yeah. at first, the Confederate forces were actually breaking through the center of the Union line, but that didn't last long. And then they were beaten back. The resulting battle, believed to be the bloodiest hours of the Civil War, involved a massive frontal assault larger than Pickett's charge at Gettysburg. The majority of the combat occurred in the dark and at close quarters. The Battle of Franklin lasted barely five hours and led to somewhere around 9,500 deaths. Shit. Also wounded and captive and counted missing soldiers all involved in that as well. It was nearly 7,000 Confederate troops that died. Wow. Fountain Branch Carter's son, Todd, was serving as an aide to a Confederate brigadier general, Thomas Benton Smith. What's with these three names on everybody? They were all psychopaths. Isn't that what you do with them? You give them three names, right? <laughs> that is the thing. 
thing. You're so right. During the Battle of Franklin, uh, Todd was, you know, serving this uh, general, and he was shot down while leading a desperate charge just southwest of his childhood home. Todd was brought to the house where he died two days later. Mm, That's sad. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, gosh, we're not even going to talk about that. You can never watch your child go through that. No, No. there's no right or wrong to what was going on. You just feel for your family member, you know? Yeah. Down at the Carton Plantation, Confederate units formed up for the assault as the battle wore on. Wounded, combat, shocked men drifted back to the mansion. The lady of the house, Carrie McGavick, opened her home as a hospital. (laughs) But there's some paranormal shit going on at her place, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm. The staff officer wrote that the wounded and hundreds were brought to the house during the battle and all through the night. And when the noble house could hold no more, the yard was appropriated until the wounded and dead filled that as well. Oh, fuck. On the morning of December 1st, 1864, the bodies of four Confederate generals killed during the fighting were all laid across the Carton back porch. The floors of the plantation were stained with blood that is still there today. The heaviest (laughs) stains are found in one of the southern-facing bedrooms because it served as the operating room. Why did they bring them up to the porch? Because they're special. Because they're generals. Okay. I don't know. Because why they couldn't leave them in the grass? Yeah. Where their blood wouldn't stain the I, shit. I, I, think, I think making it an attempt to get them into the house to have like immediate care taken. Oh. Over. I'm not okay. really sure why all four of them were laid on the porch. Seems odd that they're all in the same place. But you think that's where they just that's where they they were running. They got up to the porch and they just like, and it, then it happened to the next one, and then it happened to the next one. What if they were all just chilling mm-hmm. in a meeting? And then they were like, boom, 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 taken yeah. out. No, they went out really... to have a smoke, and then they just, <laughs> yep. They weren't even involved in the war. Right. They just, yeah. Just watching it from afar, <laughs> and they just got taken out. No, I imagine it was something about making a place of honor for them, and that just happened to be, for some reason, the back porch. Man, but their blood has soaked through those beams, and now the stains are still there. Yeah, you can't get that stuff out. Yeah, no. I mean, you can't get blood out of a shirt, so of course, you can't get it off your porch either. The shit is just no, there. it soaks into the wood, you know? I know. It's always just sound <laughs> weird. Anyway. I know, and you're very confident about, like, murder and blood spatter and things like that. <laughs> Don't you know? <laughs> I know these things. Anyways, on to my story. It's all those true crime shows. It's not that I'm a murderer, okay? Long, deep pause. (laughs) (laughs) Don't look at me. When the two families, the Carter and Lotes family, emerged from their shelter, uh, the area was just a wasteland. Damn. Piles of bodies and evidence of brutal hand-to-hand combat were seen. Eyewitness reports say that it seemed... As if some men had died standing up because their bodies were in the center of all these other bodies stacked around them so oh. that they couldn't fall, like, you know, once they had died. So they, they're just like corpses, like Ooh. standing up because of it. You know, you, you ever watch the Battle of the Bastards mm. on Game of Thrones? Well, it was like that. What season was that? Um, Six. Four, five. Man, I mean, that seems like around the time when I started paying attention. I just don't remember that. Yeah, I think so, too. But uh, it paints a good picture of what this might have looked like, I think. Hmm. So in my fantasy That's... world that I live in, <laughs> when I'm watching my bullshit shows. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know this is like a real thing that happened to people. And here I am like, you know that one time on Game of Thrones? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so rude. Uh, <laughs> during the night, the Union uh, troops withdrew to Nashville where the fortifications were second only to what was around Washington, D.C. at that time. Hood pursued, and on December 15th and 16th, Union troops under Major General George H. Thomas attacked the outnumbered Confederates, shattering what remained of their army and forcing it to withdraw to Tupelo, Mississippi. Oh. Uh, it is said that the Battle of Nashville was basically won at Franklin. I mean, they were already pretty beaten down. Yeah. 
In the years that followed the war, the Carter family made efforts to rebuild their farm and uh, revitalize their livelihood, but the farm was never the same again. It was never profitable after the war. Moscow Carter, the oldest boy, I'm assuming, since his name was listed first, uh, though I don't know that for a fact, Mm -hmm. he sold the home and the land in 1896. The Carter House was purchased by the state of Tennessee in 1951, and it was first opened to the public in 1953. Today, it is managed along with the Carrington Plantation by the Battle of Franklin Trust and is dedicated to the Carter family and all Americans who fought in this battle. Their legacy is their mission. So when it was sold, I guess, by Moscow, whoever he sold it to, it, it wasn't the state of Tennessee at that point. He no. sold, he must have sold it to a family or somebody. Yeah. And they kept the house up, I guess, until they were just like, I can't, I can't deal with all of this land anymore. Yeah. But I mean, like for a little over 50 years uh, or whatever, maybe almost close to 60 years, it, it went from between other families before oh. it was ever bought by the state okay. um, to become what it is today, which is a museum and everything. But we're going to really talk about who else lived there, you know, yeah, or yeah. whatever. It's weird. Like, at what point does someone just say, I'm not even going to bother with trying to sell this to another person who wants to live here. I'm just going to turn it over to the state. Like, how does that come up? I don't know. You know, did somebody get super involved in the idea of restoring and preserving history that they were like, that house has got a lot going on. Are you about to sell that? Or maybe it sit vacant for a few years, not being able to be sold, maybe in rough shape type situation. Who knows? But I imagine that that could be the case. You know, it transferred by owners through time. (laughs) And then at some point it was just a little like, hey, I know what would be really great for that. Well, I'm just curious because do you think I could sell my home to the state of Tennessee? I mean, I could spend some (laughs) stories. (laughs) <laughs> you tell them the Battle of Atoka was fought right there in your backyard. <laughs> that was one right here. You know why that fence falls down all the time? That's where, <laughs> yep, because of the ghosts. It's not the soft ground. Nope. The blood it's, is stained on that board. It's the troops charging through. <laughs> Epically. Epically. Every summer, after every windstorm, whatever. <laughs> Right. It's not the tornadoes that go through there. <laughs> it's ghosts. Obviously. It's an excuse for everything. Obviously. I'm kind of up on a hill, so it makes sense. I was at a, you know, I was at an advantage. I was up at the top of that hill, so it was prime location for someone to come and, you know, sit like they did at that one house. They they came and they accommodated whatever was there on my land before. Yeah, to watch what was going yeah. on. Yeah. yeah, from up above. I get it. <laughs> I'm with you. I'll help you sell this idea. Yes. I'm going to uh, look them up as soon as we're done with this podcast. The Atoka Preservation Society. <laughs> we'll call them up. All right. So the Lotes family, after the war, they were overwhelmed with joy to actually see that their house was still standing, yeah. though it was damaged. But, you know, uh, Johan, he's a master carpenter, so he was quick to make the repairs to the house, and they were ready to get back to regular life. They struggled financially and they saw hard times, but what really drove them away in the end is that, uh, yeah, they kind of had an issue with their neighbors. See, remember Johan, and, and not simply because he's a German immigrant, but he is a German immigrant in the South and he did not use slaves to build his house, so he seemed to have a difference of opinion than a lot of people around yeah. him. And he also knew how to build pianos. Oh. And so he had built this piano, and then somebody had figured out that he drew a little design on the bottom of the piano. And it was a little controversial. So when the neighbors found out, they made threats to his life, oh. and it forced him and his family to flee yeah. from their home. So this was an image of an American eagle holding up an American flag in one foot and a Confederate flag in the other. But that flag was pointing down. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, some people could say he was recording history, and then a bunch of his nosy-ass fucking neighbors said that he was a hater. Yeah, he... So... You just don't do that shit down south. (laughs) Just think it, but don't say it out loud. (laughs) Yeah, right? Don't carve it into a piano. He's like, I'm going to show them. Right. He just had to, you know, express himself, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate, obviously, his frame of mind. He's a good person, 
But, uh, you know, the the threat of assault from his stupid ass fucking neighbors basically yeah. made him be like, you know what? I don't need this. Yeah, no shit. So they lived in Memphis for a time and then they moved across country to San Jose, California. Wow. Yeah, they were like, we, uh, we, we're we done with all of this. Yeah, stuff. no. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say, as soon as you started describing the insignia, that I've seen that before. And it might have been on like Antiques Roadshow or something like that. Oh, that would be cool. It seems very familiar, the eagle with the two flags, and one is in the controversial, like, motion. Yeah. I feel like I've totally seen it before, too, and it wasn't on a piano. So it must yeah. have been a common sign of, like, yeah. you know, solidarity between the people that, you know, were against the whole thing in the first place. Yeah. But in that time after war, a lot of those people were seeing really rough times with new taxes and new, you know, they couldn't yeah. make their livelihood. I'm not making excuses for them, but I'm saying their whole world was fucking turned upside down. Yeah. So they were easily irritated by anybody that's like, y'all got what y'all deserve. Oh, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I see that. So, yeah, you don't, you don't want it. Bad neighbors, they make for a bad life. So, yeah, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> the McGavick family down at the Carton Plantation, they uh, they prospered fine, fair, I would say, after the okay. war. They must have had, like, old money, so they were kind uh, of okay. Yeah. In 1866, Mrs. McGavick and her husband, John, gave two acres near their home and adjacent to their own family cemetery as a burial ground for nearly 1,500 uh, soldiers that had passed away during the battle. Wow. including 225 who were unidentified bodies. You know, oh. they they assume that they're mostly Confederate soldiers, that they had moved into the cemetery. They were buried somewhere, mm -hmm. and then they were brought to this cemetery because it had been two years. You oh. know? And so they could make it a dedicated cemetery to the Confederates that had lost their lives. But they also took in like 225 unidentified bodies. Mm. Just to spice things well, up, I guess, huh? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why they were just like, yeah, we'll take those few strays too. <laughs> <laughs> because there's totally a cemetery that was dedicated to the Union soldiers during the battle as well. That's in Stones River National Cemetery in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So I guess they didn't know what to do with these other ones. So the, the McGavick family said they'll. I'll Man, you're just like all around our old hometown area, our old stomping, stomping grounds. Around. Yeah, for yeah. real. <laughs> The McGavicks maintain the cemetery until their respective deaths. Today, the McGavick Confederate Cemetery is the lasting memorial honoring those fallen soldiers and the Battle of Franklin. The McGavick family owned Carton Plantation until 1911 oh. when Susie Lee McGavick, widow of the son, Winder or Winder, okay. I don't know. <laughs> McGavick sold it. Today, the town of Franklin is a poster child example of Main Street restoration of historic downtown area. Its streets are lined with boutiques and mm -hmm. it's crowded with tourists and soccer moms. You know, it's fancy pants. It is very it's, fancy pants. It is a cute fucking town. That's for sure. It's adorable. And it's like, look at how cute we are. That's what Tennessee's all about. Small town cuteness. Sure. Right. But just a few hundred yards <laughs> <laughs> beyond that still stands these three homes that had bared witness wow. to the carnage that once occurred there. Mm. All three locations serve as museums to preserve their history. That's cool. And all three locations are haunted as fuck. <laughs> Ooh. And like. Who's haunting? Because, I mean, there's so many possibilities at this point. There was so much shit, like you said, the carnage. So it could be, and they're haunted museums. Can you stay at a haunted museum? Nope. I didn't see anything about overnights or anything like that, but they do do ghost tours all the time. Oh. And then you can go in and just tour the <laughs> home as well. I'm acting like I didn't know that because like, <laughs> they do. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> you mean this pamphlet is telling the truth? <laughs> Oh my God, this is blowing my mind. So, of course, stories of uh, seeing Confederate soldiers, or just soldiers, period, on the grounds uh, around the homes is very common, as is hearing the sounds of battle and even battle drums late at Ooh, night. Creepy. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Or is it kind of like, ah, oh, listen to that ghostly sound? <laughs> <laughs> like crickets? But it's yeah. It's like ghost drums. Coming closer. The ghosts are very active this <laughs> night. <laughs> 
How nice. We love that. But uh, <laughs> at the Lotz house, the most popular ghost story comes from the Lotz children, actually. Often mischievous things happened within the home. People have felt their, like, pant leg being tugged. Oh. And they've seen faces of children in the windows when no one's supposed to be in the Ooh, house. Are they sad faces or are they like, peace out, guys. Come again. Come visit us again. Like, what are their faces like? You know, they don't say whether they're happy or sad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would assume, like, if they know they're dead, they're probably pretty pissed about it. Yeah, right. So they're angry, grumpy little babies. Or they could just be like, this is great. Yeah. We have a whole house to ourselves. I don't know. If they're only, like, tugging at pant legs and they're not, like, you know, slicing at your ankles or anything, then maybe they're just like, hey, guys, come back and visit us again or something. You know, they're maybe they're a little lonely. Yeah, well, I... I sadly think, like, what if they're trying to get your attention? Like, hey, man, pick me up. Like, take care of me. Feed me. And then everybody leaves at night, and they just sit at the window, like, Watching. what the fuck? <laughs> Where are those drugs like, coming from? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're watching that. I don't know. But, you know, it's all ghost children are always, like, it's sad to hear about. And so you, you want to know that hopefully they accept what's going on, or they don't know better not to accept it. Right. So. Hopefully they have some kind of peace, even though they're still wandering around. As children often do. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Tour guides have witnessed the apparition of a woman also in the Lotz house. She's wearing a nightgown and she's holding a candle and she's crying. (laughs) She's not fun, but uh, no, (laughs) she's upset. And apparently she calls for someone named Anne. It's believed that the woman is calling for Mrs. Lotz whose middle name is Anne. I find that as a stretch. Like, yeah, that's a stretch. my middle name's Anne. I don't go by yeah. Anne. Like, never. No. Never. Nope, nope. No one's ever called nope. me that. So I don't think that Mrs. Lotz, I mean, like, yeah, her name was Margarita. So <laughs> I said that kind of Spanish-like. But um, Well, when you showed me her name, too, I thought, well, she doesn't have to be German. I wonder if she wasn't, and maybe she was a different nationality. But Oh, yeah, you're right. Wasn't I thought there was an Annie. Wasn't there an Annie ch- child? Exactly. So nobody seems to piece this together that there was an Annie at the Carter house. They're neighbors. So that was one of the little girls. Yeah. So who also is said to haunt the Carter house? Like Aww. they say that Annie's still at the Carter house. So I'm not really sure why the Lotz house, their tour guides haven't pieced together that maybe this person is looking for her friend, her neighbor, Annie, who lived next door or whatever. Yeah. And that's my opinion. I don't understand why I didn't see that anywhere else. Um, I could just be making stories up, but I thought it was cool to try to understand why these two spirits can't connect with each other. Like, why don't they, you know, why can't yeah. she find Annie? She's just right next door, man. They're She's 110 the- steps away. Huh. There's probably a busy street in the way now. That's <laughs> yeah. scary. I get it. But, like, they're so close to each other. As soon as you said that she's crying and calling for Anne, that that was the first thing that I had thought, too. I was like, well, wait, what about Annie? That doesn't make sense where they're not, like, piecing that together. Just like, no, clearly it's so-and-so's middle name. Nope. Because (laughs) if I'm crying as a spirit, I'm not going to be calling for Anne, my best friend. I'll be saying, Wendy. (laughs) Where's Wendy? I'm not going to be like, Anne, let's just change shit up. Because Anne ain't going to respond to me, ever. No, I'd be like, who are you talking to? <laughs> oh, that's my name. Right. <laughs> Do you ever forget what your middle name is? I often try to. I hate it so much. Yeah, right. It's me too. <laughs> if somebody called me Anne, I'm like, who Who are they talking to? Yeah, that would be me too. That wouldn't register to me. So I just, I thought that was strange. I thought, I guess they were trying to keep it within the house. Yeah. You know, for anybody that's trying to investigate the house or they're into the ghost stories and they're trying to connect it back to the people that lived there. Don't go tour that other oh, house. <laughs> they are obviously not working together. Oh, they don't um, get like a, a three for one special like you do in Salem. You know, you get the sticker, yeah. then you get like a discount when you go to this place and that place too. When you go to yeah. all of them. They totally should. If I was marketing this shit, I'd be like, she's talking about her best friend, Annie Carter. Go next door and you can meet right. Annie. Go tell Annie that so and so's looking for her over right, exactly. here. Exactly. <laughs> you can spend thirty five bucks and just tour this place. Or you can spend 40 bucks and get all three. I mean, that sounds like a win-win. That's a deal. That's what I'm saying. (laughs) I'd go for that. Yeah, right? 
Mm-hmm. But yeah, so oddly enough, in the stories of the Lotes house, nobody mentions like the fact that Annie Carter is said to haunt the Carter house. And that they could be just trying to communicate with each other. But yes, in the Carter house, they are also experiencing ghostly activity. And they believe not only is it possible Confederate soldiers on the ground or just soldiers, period, on the grounds and all of that. But they think that the two names that they connect with the hauntings is Annie, one of the daughters, who didn't die during the battle, by the way. Oh. But, I mean, she lived out her days, but she was a part of helping to bring her brother Todd, who died during the battle, from the battlegrounds into the house. So that's a a tough experience for someone, and that's a lot of emotion she could have imprinted, you know, and left there, and left a piece of herself there. That's just my opinion. Again, making up stories. I love doing that. Anyways. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think I got this all figured out. <laughs> so the house is said to be haunted by Annie and Captain Todd Carter, who was wounded on the battlefield and then brought to the house and later passed away. He's appeared several times in the Carter house. Once when a visitor was looking around the first floor bedroom where Todd had died, Todd's apparition suddenly materialized sitting on the bed and then a few minutes later just vanished. Oh, wow. Was someone sleeping in the bed? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know it's a museum, but I was just curious. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you get a chance, nobody's paying attention, lay down. Yeah, right. Just, yeah. Maybe that's why he disappeared, because he was like... Oh, excuse me. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. I mean, what are you doing here? <laughs> Phantom gone. <laughs> <laughs> One visitor during a tour immediately felt sick to their stomach once they entered the home and the sickness worsened and worsened as they went down into the basement area. It got so bad that they had to excuse themselves from the tour. They returned to the first floor and waited there alone while standing there alone, which is like, sounds like totally an excuse I would make to try to get in the house somewhere. Yeah. Nice. (laughs) So note to self, pull that shit next time. Uh, (laughs) But while standing alone, they heard a clicking sound and turned just in time to see a lock on a door moving by itself. Oh, freaky. They opened the door and there was nobody on the other side. So the lock that they saw was turning like they were inside a room and there was a lock that they could see physically being turned. So the lock was on the inside of the room, right? Yes, though I guess there are some kind of locks that if you're using a key on one side, you would still see it move like a bolt Yeah, type situation. Okay. So they could have been on the other side. Yeah. Either way, that shit was moving. They knew nobody was in the room with them. They opened yeah. the door to see if somebody's on the other side and nobody's on the other side. Hmm. So still something moving by itself. Yeah. Whether it's, you know, this kind of deadbolt or that kind of deadbolt. Okay. Still odd. Yeah. Uh, Another tour guest said that they felt overwhelmed with sadness within the Carter home once entering, and it continued throughout the tour, but once they left the house, they were completely fine. Employees have told stories of hearing men shouting. Some have also mentioned feeling like someone was watching them, and some even report being pushed or touched when they're alone. Sometimes I think like when something catches you off guard, it might feel like it's more aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> so the touching and the pushing sound like two <laughs> different extremes. Right. Yeah. I've, I've thought about that before because it's like something could actually just be scared and trying to get the fuck through there. You just happen to be in, yeah. in its way. So it's not actually trying to harm you or frighten you. It's just trying to get past you as quickly as possible. You feel like either this wind or you feel pushed or whatever. And you're like, oh, I'm being attacked. But really the ghost is just like, y'all are freaking me out. <laughs> you're scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> Was well, at the James Eldridge house, and we've talked about this before because it's one of our podcast episodes. But I mean, there's something that came up on me, and yes, it didn't feel good, no. but it didn't physically push me. But it felt like it was telling me to get the fuck out. Yeah, you know. So you know, some of those things are not actual like shoving you down fucking stairs or nothing, but the feeling of the presence could be so heavy that yep. it feels it feels like it kind of it's pushing you away type yeah. thing. It can feel negative. 
just because yeah. it's it's something that's unnatural. You can't explain it and your body reacts. And the only yeah. thing for you to do is to be scared or, you know, fight or flight, that sort of thing. You got to go. Ugh. Yeah. And I'm a flight. Scooby-Doo. So. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's go. Um, given its dramatic and tragic history, it's not at all surprising that the Carter house is haunted or even the Lopes house, you know? Yeah. In an article by David Roth in the October-November 1986 issue of Blue and Gray, I guess <laughs> it's like a newsletter, maybe oh. it's a magazine, I don't know, this is from 1986, so yeah. who the fuck knows? It's definitely not an internet post. <laughs> so right. The uh, Carter House curator, uh, Dolores Kessner, said a number of poltergeist pranks have happened within the Carter home. Oh. One hostess, Annie Mae, was conducting a tour when a visitor suddenly interrupted her to announce that a statue behind the hostess was jumping up and down on the dresser that she was kind of standing next to. And by the term statue, I envision more like a knickknack, you know, but I guess big enough that it people think it's a statue, you know, but it's not a statue in a garden. It's not that. Okay. It's not like life size. When you said statue, that's exactly like I'm thinking of a fountain, yeah. like there's water spewing out of its mouth. But then right? you said he's on a dresser, so that I'm thinking like music box statue, I guess. It's like a knickknack, but large, you know, it's a pretty big knickknack or whatever. All right. And it's going up and down. So it's like a ghost could be picking it up oh. and, you know, moving it around. Creepy. Walking into the parlor on another occasion, hostess Cindy, another tour guide, you know, mm-hmm felt a tug on her jacket. She turned and expecting to see like a child or something. She saw nothing. Oh, there was nobody. There. Love it. That happened in a cemetery one time. Uh, you weren't there. I went with my mom because she likes to be adventurous like that sometimes. And my cousin and I had a, a crossbody bag and you could feel just something all of a sudden like pull on that strap. I thought my mom was behind me because, you know, I'm all up in my camera, so I'm not paying attention. And uh, I thought she must have been behind me. So I turned like she, I thought she was trying to stop me. And I was the last person. There was nobody behind me. They were all in front of me. Wow. <laughs> so it's a cool when you're like, oh, excuse me, but. Oh, there's no one there. Yeah. <laughs> That's always a really cool experience. Like, I know I didn't just fucking make that up in my head. Something stopped me dead in my tracks for me to look and see, like, what do you need? And there's nobody there. Yeah, I know what you mean. What cemetery was that at? So it's next to the Bethel one. So it's the W.A. Roger Cemetery. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a third hostess, Mary West actually saw the Carter girl's apparition, Annie's apparition. Mary had gone upstairs to shut a window when she heard a door close behind her. (laughs) That's alarming. Uh, Mary ran to the door and opened it like, who the fuck? Right. (laughs) Yeah. Because she thinks she's alone. And she saw Annie Carter run across the hallway and down the stairs. Mary said she ran too, right out of the fucking house. (laughs) (laughs) She had to have known it was haunted. I guess she just thought it would never happen to her. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. You don't expect to see something like that ever. Yeah. So it always catches you off and you're a little like, I need to step outside. (laughs) Yes, please. So back to Annie Mae, she also reports that she was locking up the house one night. She was, you know, kind of going through and she's having to clean up. She's with another tour guide. Uh, Her name's Emma. And they hear somebody's name be called. And it's Annie. They're like, Annie. And this is in the Carter house. Oh, my God. But her name's Annie. So she's like, huh? And, you know, looks. And she's like, okay, there's nobody there. Uh, never mind. And goes back to what she was doing about closing up the house. And then again, they hear Annie. Uh-uh. And she's like, I'm sorry. Am I sorry? <laughs> Do you need my attention? So it's unclear if this is some other kind of spirit that's trying to speak to Annie Carter. Or if it's a spirit, yeah. like Annie, trying to call the other Annie. I mean, it's easy to kind of think that this person was trying to speak to Annie Mae when you hear that years before this, a lady named Nancy was working in the house to help restore it before they opened it up as a museum. And while she was in the house, she heard her name called. So it's 
far as I know, there's no Nancys in the Carter family. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's like intelligent versus residual. You're like, I don't yeah, know. That's true. But it's neat to think that maybe someone who spends a lot of time there can warm up to some spirit. And, and Nancy, yeah, I didn't hear a single Nancy. Now I did hear some Annie's. So there's mm. <laughs> so lots of Annie's all over the place. And then there was a time, like we spoke, spoke about before, that the Carter family, or I'm sorry, the Carter home was owned by other yes, families. Yes, right. True. So you don't really know what happened in those 60 years yeah. that it might have passed by other owners and if there was some Nancy in that. But it seems very odd that here are these two names being called out. Yeah. And they happen to be people that are working within the home. Yeah. I mean, what are the chances that also there were people that lived in the home that were by that same name? Right. Obviously, Annie seems like a very common name <laughs> with these spirits. But Nancy? I mean, to have the two show up, that's a bit interesting. Yeah. So what's there might actually be intelligent and not just residual, like hearing, like seeing the soldiers, like hearing the battle drums, you know, and that type thing. Maybe there is some intelligent yeah. spirits in these locations. Right. And last but not least, it is said that out of the three locations, the Carton Plantation is the most haunted. Oh. Some people say it is the most haunted house in the entire state. Interesting. Yeah, you know, we talked about that in the, the Myrtle Plantation yeah, episode. Right. It depends <laughs> on where you are. We can label these things. Yeah. <laughs> At least they did, you know, lower their standards to state. Yes. They didn't say in all of the United States right. or the world or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> they keep it local. <laughs> <laughs> nice. As many people should. Yes. So Carrie McGavick cared deeply about the fact that so many men had lost their lives at her plantation home. That is why it was so important for them to designate the cemetery. Oh. So it is said that her spirit is sometimes seen as a full body apparition on the back porch of the Carrington plantation and the back porch overlooks where this civil war cemetery is. So a lot of people think that she's like standing watch, you know, just thinking about all those poor men, boys that lost their lives oh, there. Yeah. Wow. Wouldn't that be neat to see the full body apparition on the porch? Yeah. Like you just cruise around back and you're like, Oh look, there's a ghost right there. There, there it is. <laughs> and she's waiting long enough for me to take like 14 pictures. <laughs> That would be so nice, spirits. If any of you are listening to this podcast, please get yourself together. Be a little patient. <laughs> we got to get it out of our bag real quick. And, you know. Yeah, and then we got the you know the batteries and the lenses <laughs> and like the infrared lights and all that other shit. So just be patient with us. Let us take those pictures. Just hold it. <laughs> hold your pose there for a second. So it seems like she might do that for you. Sweet. That's very generous of her. She's always been a very kind soul. Nice. So uh, sometimes she is seen in a white dress. Others say she's in a pinkish gown. Tour guides are unsure if there are two separate spirits. You know, this is a different lady in the pink gown versus the white yeah. gown. Um, but it would make sense that sometimes she is seen in two different fashions because when all these soldiers came to her home and they were, it was operating as a hospital, not only did Mrs. McGavick jump in there and start helping kind of like as a nurse. So did her children as wow. well. Like the whole family was taking part of caring for these wounded soldiers. And they said by the end of the night or that time, her dress was fucking stained with blood. Yeah. So, I mean, you could see where that would be look pinkish. Mm -hmm. So that like could be more of the residual. Yeah. And then her in white might be kind of like, the memory of her afterwards type thing. Yeah. So it's like her in two different stages of her life, possibly. Wow. Again, I like making up stories and thinking if I was a tour guide, this is how I would tell this the is story. How it's been it. <laughs> All right. Some have even seen what they believe to be one of the general spirits pacing the back porch. This back porch is very busy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just set up shop out there and just watch the porch. Right? Yes. This awesome uh he apparently looks very worried this spirit has been known to walk around the grounds as well oh and occasionally will speak and have conversations with lone visitors like if you're by yourself 
he might approach you and just start talking to you. Oh, I don't think he knows he's dead. This guy is just trying to have his day to day. There's a stranger. I mean, is it like Jumanji style and he walks up to you and he's going to give you your quest? I mean, is that like it? That's what it kind of seems like to me. So the people that have interacted with him, they say he comes up to them and gives them like uh, advice to like prepare for this upcoming battle. You yeah. Know? He's still stuck in like this battle's about to go down. Do you have your gun? Are you taking care of yourself? You know, are you ready? Um, because there was this one guy that had reported this whole story that sounded total make believe to me. And that's so rude of me as a paranormal investigator to be like, that shit didn't happen to you. <laughs> what asset trip were you on? Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> this guy came after hours to the plantation. He's going to pay his respects in the cemetery. He walks by the poor, porch and there's a horse and a guy on the porch um and he walk as he walks up to the guy the horse disappears the horse was on the porch yes no <laughs> so i did say that weird <laughs> so the horse isn't on the porch but he's right by the porch okay and the guy's on the porch all right <laughs> and then the ho- ghost horse disappears Whoa. and the guy's like Hey, dude, did you see that horse? <laughs> Where the fuck did it go? And the general's like, I must have got shot like my horse did. I don't know. Oh, no. And then he's just talking to him like, a, you know, basically like a storm's a coming. Are you ready? You know, for this, do you got a gun? And the guy's like, no, I ain't got a gun. He's like talking to him. He said he claimed he thought that he was talking to like a reenactment person, yeah. you know, actor, whatever they call themselves. And this whole thing played out. And then, like, once the general vanished, he's kind of, like, running back to his car, like, what the fuck, you know? And I was like, you did not have a conversation with a ghost for, like, what seemed like 30 oh. minutes with all the description that you... There's no way. Like I said, they don't stick around that long. <laughs> no, and this dude didn't pull out his phone and he's just like, dude, do you mind if I get a <laughs> selfie? Just... That's a great costume you're wearing. Like, can I get a picture? Right. No, it never dawned on him, even with the horse disappearing. It took so long for him to catch on what was going on. Oh, Oh I think he even said he started hearing the sounds of, like, battle. And that's, like, where he started being like, wait, what is going on? I don't see any other reenactment characters, you know, here. Well, now I can understand why he's like, uh, I got to go I think right I, now. I would have to be like, I need to go drink some water or something down from this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Right. Uh, so from the description of everybody that's run into this general, the description matches General Pat Cleburne, which was w- among one of the generals that had passed away. You know, one of the four that had died during the battle. Wow. But he has a mustache and a short beard and piercing eyes. As all ghosts do. Mm-hmm. They all have the piercing eyes. Just like Colonel Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> Many have seen the apparition of soldiers around the gravestones. The activity seems to be heightened at dusk, oh. which is around the same time the battle was fought. Yeah. Soldiers have been seen in the bedrooms of the house as well, as they may have spent their last moments in those spaces. Oh, yeah. Objects have been known to move in the bedrooms on more than one occasion. Yeah, like that statue? Yeah. Well, that was in the Carter house. This is the Carton plantation. Oh, okay. But yes. Uh, they were talking about a picture frame that can't, kept constantly falling or whatever and they would find it not only did it like oh it just fell off this dresser and it's on the floor right in the dresser nope it's on the other side of the fucking room and everybody's like why the fuck and you know that's so that kind of thing kept happening stuff was moved into different places that it's like shouldn't have gotten there just had it fallen off the walls either you know yeah not only do numerous ghosts haunt the house but the (laughs) like i said Horses, ghost horses, also like to hang out around there. That was seen once. And then everybody hears gun and cannon fire around the house and the grounds. And they hear unexplainable moans and sighs in the cemetery. Oh. a lot of, you know, a lot of these soldiers, like I said, when the house was full up, they just started putting them out in the yard and stuff too. Oh, man. So. Where they rest now might have been, like, right where people passed away as well, or themselves even passed away. Dang. But not all of the hauntings at the Carton Plantation are connected to the Battle of Franklin. Nope. In the 1840s, a young 
house servant girl was murdered in the kitchen by a jealous male who was offended when she rejected his advances. Oh, wow. So he strangled her. Oh, so that's how he deals with that sort of rejection. Right. And you die. So, how dare you? No one rejects me. Yeah, I bet he won a lot of ladies after that. Yeah, I bet so. <laughs> so her spirit is said to haunt the house. She's mischievous, apparently. Uh-huh. But all she does is like, her job in the kitchen. I mean, like they say she's mischievous because she moves shit around the house, but they blame that on the soldiers too. Yeah. So, right. I mean, like who's at fault here? They also say they hear disembodied noises in the kitchen as if someone's like working and it's around the times of like, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner or whatever. So kind right. of residual sound. They hear the sound of running water when water's not actually running. So oh. mischievous or like she just fucking getting her job done i mean like i don't know they have a weird definition of mischievous mischievous <laughs> yeah she's so mischievous she's in there cooking yeah ooh. <laughs> like you're just having ooh, aren't you having a good time cooking you silly thing no. i know right <laughs> Now, if she was actually making you like biscuits and gravy, right? And then you went there because you saw the plate all full of food and that shit then vanished. That's a little mischievous. That would be hilarious. That's a good one. (laughs) (laughs) But they say that stuff moves around the kitchen too and it's put in odd places. But that was happening in the bedroom. So you really don't know who that is. And I mean... (laughs) Is it really that odd? Like, she's supposed to be in control of the kitchen. Maybe you're not supposed to be walking your fucking ass through there. I mean, like, (laughs) maybe you're in her way. (laughs) So I'm going to move the salt from here to all the way the fuck over there. That's what you get, (laughs) sir. The McGavick children are also believed to haunt the home, like the Lotes house. They have seen children peering out the windows. That's that's all they do. And then they talk about shit getting moved around, you know, like, it could be anybody. There's soldiers, there's yeah. the house servant, there's the children, you know, I think they're all up to some nonsense. I mean, they're bored. <laughs> they're like, let's just rearrange stuff. I don't like where this just is. Fuck with them. <laughs> we have nothing else better to do. So the Lutz house was on an episode that the Tennessee Rape Chasers did. Oh. It was when they did their Haunted Live. Oh. Not that much happened. <laughs> like, yeah. If you ask me, it was all the same kind of reports. They were getting hits on their equipment, and they were hearing, like, weird bangs and stuff like that. It was basically, you know, it went along with a lot of the things that people said about the home already. Yeah. But they didn't see any extraordinary apparitions or anything like that yeah Ooh, those friday night late episodes of the haunted live and i skipped quite a few of them i was just like no guys i can't it is a long period of time of uh, a lot of them trying to just fill it yeah yeah <laughs> you know? and i guess that's like because maybe they really did i guess they did really record these things live yeah. and stuff so you, and you can't control when ghosts want to appear no. so that it didn't really come from too much from that but if people want to go and watch that you can find it on youtube and watch the whole thing that's the only place that i found it the tennessee ghost and paranormal investigators are in gpi they published photos taken at the garden plantation they said that in these photos which i'm going to send to you right now it shows a man sitting on a bench to the right of the door and a woman in a large dress standing to his right so this was the only like kind of cool evidence that i could find online Uh, you very much have to zoom in (laughs) well somebody drew like a square around the guy sitting on the porch (laughs) okay so that one i see in case you didn't see it right i think that's the one that the woman the white next to him is supposed to be her dress okay i honestly not too into that photo as i am the one that you you get more of a view of the porch it does look like there's a total guy sitting in a chair you see the one i think it's the is the first one i sent you well the first one you sent me there's like a guy like walking like out in the yard, you see him like blocking the the railing and everything. Yes, there is. I did not even see that. That's like really crazy. <laughs> see, they claim that nobody was on the porch. Okay. They did say that there were people headed out or not that they were headed out. They said that their people were 
in the cemetery. There's somebody on that porch. There's somebody on the porch. So that I focused on that. It's a full moon. I just realized that too, where it looks yeah. beautiful. Um, so the person on the porch definitely shouldn't have been there. Kind of out in the yard, it almost yeah. looks like there's two people standing near each other, possibly. You see like this white, you know, could be like their sweaters or shirts or whatever. I don't know. Uh, you assume that that's their gang maybe going out to the cemetery, but you're right. That darker shadow, I guess I need to go back to their website and find out, did they say that anybody was near the porch? They said they were all out in the cemetery and this one person oh. was like kind of taking pictures by himself or themselves. Cause I don't know if it's a girl or not and caught these figures near the porch. That's my favorite photo. The one with the square beside it. Uh, it's rough to me. Yeah, it is rough. I don't, I know they put that square and everything, but I don't. I, know. I don't really see it. <laughs> I'm just happy that in that same photo they didn't put the squares around the orb that's up there. <laughs> I know they didn't even talk about they it. Didn't. Good for Thank them. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd like to know more about that other picture. That uh, the first one that you sent me. I mean, you see that that dark silhouette of a person, but I mean, there's definitely, like you said, there's something on the porch. And it like it has a face and it looks like it's looking yeah. right at you. That's pretty creepy. If the, if there is seriously nobody on that porch, right. if they're telling the truth, that's a dude on a that's porch. That's amazing. I mean, you see like his fleshy face, his fleshy hand. Right. Because it's not like it's wide or anything. And then he's wearing like a white shirt yeah. and he's sitting in like a rocking chair or something like that on the porch. Yeah. And then that dark shadow is very interesting. I got to go back and figure out because they, I swear they said nobody was on this porch. That's kind of a weird one. And then, like you said, there's those two things that are out in the yard. To me, they look like butterflies. Just <laughs> like... Yeah. You can't tell these are people. Right. You just know it's really dark. And then all of a sudden there's these two white things. Yeah. So they could be signs. They could just be right. some other kind of structure in the yard. Yeah. It's not explained, but I, I'm saying ignore that. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Um, but the guy said that everybody was at the cemetery and, or I say guy, I really don't know. Um, and that he was just taking pictures. He, she was just taking pictures of the house. So there should not have been any live persons in that photo. That's a good one. Yeah. So that was better than what the Tennessee rape chasers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's to no fault of theirs. Right. We've had investigations that were supposed to be, Oh my God, this is the most haunted place in the world. Right. And that night the ghosts, they just weren't filling it. No. They didn't give us anything to write home about. No. So that kind of stuff happens all the time. It, it does happen. Um, that's the, the funny thing about the, <laughs> the Tennessee rape chasers, because they're like, y'all come out now. Uh, <laughs> We're filming a live TV show, so it'd be nice if uh, you guys come out. <laughs> We're only here right. for an hour. <laughs> so, TikTok motherfuckers. <laughs> you would never talk like that. <laughs> That's how we would talk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I wonder why they weren't talking to us that night. They're like, okay, yeah, we're coming out now. <laughs> not doing nothing, nothing for y'all. Rude. <laughs> so that's it. I just wanted to pay respects to those pamphlets that I had collected <laughs> over the years, so many, many years ago. <laughs> kind of just let that story go. I may never make it back to that area again, being that I'm, you know, on the other side of the country. You are kind of somewhat, you know, too, you know, there's so many places to explore. Okay. Tennessee's always home and I always make my way back there. Yeah. But it's family it's stuff. Just, yeah, you just, and you know, they don't let me make time for no. these things. <laughs> now we're at a point where we're trying to figure out how we can get back to Tennessee to do our paranormal investigations. Whereas before, when we lived there in Tennessee, we were trying to find any other state that we could go to. Get us the fuck out of Tennessee, yeah. please. <laughs> Had I realized that I truly would move away sometime, yeah. I would have invested more time in all the stories and legends throughout Tennessee yeah. and, hey, and Mississippi. It's not over with yet. So, I mean, like we could make it back there, but, you know, I, I just never know when that will happen. So I wanted to share the story of these three historic homes yeah. and the, you know, the situation that they were put in because it was pretty fucking horrendous. I loved your story. And there's always the possibility that one of us will hit the lottery and then we can just go wherever we want from then on. Just full time. Just nonstop. Road trip. Living the dream. Yeah. <laughs> I want to live the two of us in an RV. 
visiting all the paranormal hotspots. We'll have to figure it out, like, weather-wise, yeah. when it's best to be in those areas. Yeah, right. So. Snowbird that shit. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, so I, I was saying, if you're from the Tennessee area, I'm from the fucking Tennessee area. <laughs> but, no, if you've experienced anything at these locations, I read lots of comments from people that have. Mm. So if you're listening to this podcast, if you're one of those people, share your story with us a little more in detail. You can email us directly at creatures of the night paranormal at gmail.com with your story from anything from Tennessee, but from this Nashville Franklin area would be really cool. Or you can hit us up on uh, social media, you know, at COTN underscore paranormal on Instagram. And then on Facebook and Twitter, it's COTN paranormal. There's no underscore. So, you know, no, we say it all the time if you're listening. But like I said, if you're new, that's the way to get in touch with us. We'd love to hear your stories. We'd share them on the podcast if you share them with us, unless you tell us not to. That's weird, though. Why are you writing us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you just want to become secret best friends with us, that's cool, too, I guess. Um, sure. <laughs> then, yeah. <laughs> and we well, we've got an Etsy shop. And you can also shop on our website. It's the Spirit Emporium. You can buy things to enhance your experience searching for the paranormal and also protect yourself yeah. from that shit, too, because you never know. These sound like pretty calm, mellow spirits. I think they sound like playful spirits. Yeah, I think you're fine in these areas, but we do have things yeah. to enhance your experience in communicating with them. So that might be what you're looking for in this one. I don't think you need to just like go full on with sage in your shit. Self yeah, right. <laughs> no, but some of the those places that you do go to, you do want to full on sage yourself and right. your equipment because <laughs> something might be coming home with you. You don't want that hanging around your house and your family. You just never know what's going to come home. So yeah, that's it. That's all I got. For <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Wendy. That was cool. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm being so awkward. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, then I guess we'll say goodbye. Bye. 